Se eu ligar o galelo, eu chei. Aí eu ganhei a rita o dão. De que lá o stan é hunt to lock a yele. School day to yard galea. Telequats in ela. Anito de niol. A dagi ka. Um. Jana sanoe wale do dong. Galele chei. I'm grateful to be here with you guys. Um, I realize that this is kind of a, uh, an informal, formal way of doing things, but that's okay. Um, we're here at the Cherokee Heritage Center, based in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and my name is J.P. Johnson. Um, people oftentimes call me Ahid or Enid, one or the other. Uh, those are both more, more or less nicknames uh, in, in our language. But uh, today we're here to talk a little bit about, or a lot about, our clan system. Um, this location that we're at is a, uh, uh, what people referred to a long time ago as the ancient village. And nowadays they referred to it as the trade era village. In other words, it was a little bit later in time. So it's not ancient culture and traditions. It's uh, after we began to intermingle and trade with Europeans. So we had cloth, we had all of those kinds of things. But this structure that we're inside of right now, this big building, this big building was the, the home of every public Thing that occurred within our communities a long time ago. They, they, would, they had a, a ceremonial fire inside of this giant council house, this seven-sided council house. And the community as a whole would gather inside of here for dances, celebrations, for dis, dis, to decide, make decisions be, on behalf of the community, whether they were going to war, whether they were sealing peace with someone, um, whatever. Generally, it took place in here. The meetings that took place in here were, were uh, overseen by elder women and elder men. And those families, those folks that came inside of here all belonged to a specific clan. They belonged to a specific family within their community. Cherokees and Katuas, UKBs, um, we're all the same people, and our clan system is, is something that, uh, that still exists in our communities, but it's not as it once was. At one time, when our clan system was at its fullest potential, and when it was in its heyday, before European contact, these buildings were used just in the same way I described before. They would gather together, and each one of these clan beds that you see in here represents an entire family. And whenever they came in, they would come in and treat this place as a holy place, as a sacred place, as a spiritual place, uh, but also very much social, also very much uh, about that camaraderie and interaction that, that people get from fellowship inside a church or something along those lines. When you walk in to this particular council house at the, at the Heritage Center, you'll see behind each one of these clan beds, there's, there's uh, something representing each one of these clans, starting out with red paint, deer, wolf, long hair, bird clan, blue clan, and also wild potato. Each one of these clans <clears throat> were given down or passed down within families from mother to child. We were a matrilineal society, not a patriarchal society, but, but matrilineal, and not matriarchal as well. Matriarchal and mat matrilineal are two different things. Matrilineal means that you get your bloodline and your family from your mother's side. Yes, you are directly related to your father's family as well, but they are your relatives, but they're not your blood relatives. Your father's side of the family was important and, and all of those things, but your true kin, your closest family members were on your mother's side of the family. This clan system 
was in and and of itself a foolproof system for taking care of people within our communities. It was a way to to designate who you were, but also a way to uh, ensure that everyone was taken care of, ensure that each family was taking care of their children and taking care of their elders at the same time, doing it together. So the, the clan system is probably one of the single most important things that has deteriorated as far as our culture is concerned. Yes, our language is important too, and you can't have one without the other necessarily. You need all of those things together, but our clan system was really, really important. Um, when, before European contact, before uh, the, the onslaught of, of uh, culturalization and, and all of those things, and genocide and all of the things that happened to our people down through the history, uh, things were really good. And the way that it worked was, let's say that there's a, a young woman from the Wolf Clan over here, whose family is Wolf Clan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She would specifically steer clear of Wolf Clan folks and marry from all of the other clans. That's where she would seek spouses. That's where spouses would seek her because they were looking for someone that they were not blood related to, right? So when they did that, it wasn't that the, um, the father abandoned his, his, his family. He oftentimes uh, had dual roles within um, two different families at that point. He was, he was in charge of, of taking care of his, his spouse and her children, uh, sort of financially speaking, if that makes sense, monetarily speaking. The, the Cherokee man was expected to hunt. He was expected to hunt, and he was expected to provide for him and his spouse and their children to contribute to the household. The household that they lived in would have been their, her mother's. So let's say I marry a Cherokee woman. She's from a specific clan. And I move in with the entirety of my in-laws all in one fell swoop. Uh, if that's not the school of hard knocks, I don't know what else is. Imagine being, oh, by the way, the age during this time period is about 17 and 14, so a woman would be about 14 years old and a man would be about 17. And that's the time that they would generally get, get married. We didn't have big ceremonies for, for weddings. We didn't have um, anything majorly special. There was no big celebration. They didn't have, uh, you know, fancy dress or, or a, a big ring for their fingers or any of those kinds of things. All of that stuff didn't really exist. Uh, what generally might have happened is they might have gone to water together and had that sort of ceremony. But other than that, they just moved in together, just like Cherokees now, you know, when they, we shack up. Eh? So uh, I, I move in with the entirety of my in-laws all in one fell swoop. Imagine any, any, any dumb little 17-year-old you know. At 17, you think you know everything. And then you move in with the entirety of your in-laws and you suddenly discover that you no longer know everything. In fact, uh, you you don't know enough at this point, but you move in and my job is to hunt for my, uh, and contribute to the household of this family. Let's say I'm another clan, but I move in with this family. My job is is to contribute to their household, but it's not my job to raise our kids. Me and my wife, let's say we have two kids together. Those kids don't belong to me. They don't belong to me uh, in the sense that, that they do nowadays. They belong to her, and they belong to her family. Those children have her clan, not mine. So it's my responsibility to contribute to the household, but otherwise, I'm never there. I killed a deer. How you doing? I'm out. I am never there. My job is to hunt and try to make more kids with my wife, and that's it. Aside from that, I'm spending all of my other free time with my family, maybe my family's bird. 
I'm over here with these kids, with these children, with these women and these elders and these young folks, and these kids over here are my responsibility. They belong to me. I'm supposed to take care of them. I'm supposed to teach them. I'm supposed to raise them. As their uncle, I am more connected to them than I am to my own children. Because uncle in Cherokee, on the mother's side of the family, only on the mother's side, is Talene'edod, I'm sorry, Talene'edod, which just means second dad. For the same goes for women on that side of the, on, in, within one family. The Cherokee word for aunt is telling the edgy. The Cherokee word for uncle on the mother's side of the family, both on the mother's side, is telling the adult, second dad and second mom. We have a word for aunt and uncle that's on the father's side of the family, and that's what people are commonly using nowadays. But truth be told, that original word was actually in reference to those that you were not closely related to. Eatlogi means aunt. Eatuji means uncle. So on the father's side of the family, you've got mothers, mother, father, children. On the father's side of the family, they're just your aunt and uncle. But on your mother's side of the family, that's your second mom and your second dad. That means that this whole family is full of fathers, of mothers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, the, the importance that lies there is, is, is overwhel overwhelmingly profound. And the reason being is because you've heard that saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. This is legit exactly what, I, what they're talking about. This is what that saying is referencing. It's referencing the idea that an entire family was responsible for those children. If I'm Bird Clan and my, and my relatives are all right here, then I'm responsible for raising them and teaching them, and they belong to me. I'm to treat them as if they belong to me. I don't know anything about that clan or that clan or whatever. I know about what exists within my family. And that's what I teach those kids. That's what I give those kids. If that's my clan, then that's my responsibility to pass those things down. So if you've got a mother and a father that are both raising children, they're raising children, but they're raising kids that only belong to them. So my kids, specifically my kids, their family is actually all bird clan. My, children, my actual children are all bird clan. That's not my clan. Technically, those kids don't belong to me. They belong to them. And it's them that are, that are responsible for raising them. I can't stress how important that is how important that system is and the way that it was a long time ago. Let's say I married some girl and I'm, my responsibility is, is, is not with them. My responsibility is only to contribute to the household and only to help out monetarily speaking. It isn't to, uh, to um, teach those children anything. It isn't to, to be necessarily responsible for them. So. It was those aunts and uncles on the mother's side of the family that were so much more important. When our people began to, to uh, interact with Europeans, when Europeans first came into the picture, and they saw this system in place, it, to them it was uh, an insult to their manhood. It was an insult that your biological children weren't your responsibility and didn't belong to you. Your wife didn't belong to you. None of those things belong to you. A very 
uh, patriarchal ideal was being pushed in this direction. When they came amongst our people, they didn't want to talk to the women, they wanted to talk to the men. When Europeans came amongst us and began trading with us, they wanted to deal with the men and not the women. But what they really didn't realize was that these women were the ones who owned the homes. These women were the ones that owned the, the land. These women were the ones that were responsible and, and owned the children. They didn't realize that they were talking to the wrong people because they were so focused on dealing only with men. And that was a major mistake in, in our history because they didn't get all of the information that they could have got had they spoken with the women. So these Europeans are, are, are uh, flooding our, our, uh, our shores and they're, they're coming to initially trade with us um, and we're interacting with them quite heavily. When they're amongst us, they begin to intermarry with us. And when they began to intermarry, they, they, the men that married Cherokee women ended up doing whatever those Cherokee women wanted them to do, which was participate fully in the, in the, in the uh, uh, ceremonial life and all of those kinds of things. But if a man that was Cherokee married a white woman, it was that point right then and there when the clan system began to break down. And the reason that it began to break down is not because those women were not clan members. It was because they didn't accept the ceremonial and spiritual life ways that we had. You see, Cherokees and other southeastern tribes and other woodlands tribes have been marrying and intermingling with each other since forever since absolutely the beginning of time. That means that if we go back in our genealogy just a little bit with anybody in Oklahoma, anybody that's uh, enrolled Cherokee or UKB or, or Muscogee Creek or Shawnee or uh, Uchi or any of these tribes that exist within Oklahoma, if you go back a little bit into just about everybody's genealogy, you're going to start seeing names on your genealogy list that are your ancestors that came from different tribes. The Muscogee Creek, there's lots of Cherokees mixed with Creek, Nachi, uh, Aninochi, uh, the, the Pine people uh, was another southeastern tribe. We were mixing with each other for forever. When we were mixing with each other, all of these tribes, they all had a clan system, all of them. All of the tribes that we interacted with had a version or a clan system, a subsystem that existed within their communities, within their tribe, within their uh, uh, people as a whole. When they came amongst us and we married with them, they fell right into what we were doing. They didn't always add up, right? Um, let's see, the Seneca people, we mixed with the Seneca quite a bit. We used to fight with them quite a bit too. Um, they have clans that don't match up with our clans. They have some that do, but they have some clans that don't exist within the, the boundaries of a Cherokee clan. So let's say uh, I'm a, a, uh, leading a war party, and we go out and we're fighting with the Seneca. And we're, uh, we have a battle with them, or we, we attack them, or whatever, and we take some captives from the Seneca and we bring them back to our community, which would look just like this. Once we've brought them back to this community, um, oftentimes, generally, the, 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 uh, the majority of the women of the community, especially the elder women, would make the decisions on what we were to do with these, these captives that we had taken. And most often than not, those people were then taken into families and they replaced dead loved ones if there were particularly atrocious individuals that had done really awful things or something along those lines to us, uh, you know, the Cherokee women of the community might decide to torture them to death. So, you know, you got, you got one or two options. But generally, they were absorbed into the community. So let's say we've taken these Seneca women and Seneca men as captive. We have five or six of each. And we take them inside of here, and we're deciding their fate. 
After we've done that and they've been basically accepted and absorbed by the community, man, I think that Seneca woman's kind of keen. I'm going to, you know, I might marry one of those Seneca women. But wait a minute. She's eel clan. We don't have no eel clan. How is she even a part of this community? How is she even a part of any family here? How can our children have a Cherokee clan? The truth is, is before that would have happened, they would have been taken directly into a clan and taken in as family. The systems that they had in place, the ceremonial fires, the dances, the songs, the medicine, the ceremonies, all of that stuff that we have in Cherokee communities, they had them in other communities as well. And they were very similar, if not almost identical. And if that's the case, they had no problem stepping into a clan, becoming a part of a family, and then marrying within that community, and then passing down that clan that they were taken into. What I'm telling you is that originally we had a system for dealing with the lack of a clan. A system that, that, that functioned very well. We, we intermarried with all of the tribes that were around us. But when the Europeans came amongst us, we would have done the same thing with those women. If there, were a, if there was a white or a European woman that wanted to marry a Cherokee man, and she wanted to be a part of this family and a part of this community and so on and so forth, she would have been absorbed into a clan just as well. But they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to participate in these things. They didn't want to be considered Indian in any way, shape, or form, and in fact probably liked the idea of hiding the fact or the fact that they would marry uh, folks who were already mixed so that they could pretend that they weren't actually native people, they were something else. And so it was that point that it stopped, that, 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 that it didn't stop, it just, um, the system began to break down. So the Europeans are then bringing in slaves. They're bringing in um, people from all over the world sometimes uh, and bringing them in as slaves. Those folks were generally indigenous people in some way, shape, or form. They were either indigenous Africans or they were uh, from Panama or some, da some island in the south or something along those lines. But those people that they were bringing in, they accepted the idea of tribal identity. They took to communal life in Cherokee communities. So those folks, when they came amongst us, they began to, to adopt it, but it was just the, the mothers, white female mothers of our uh, communities during this time period that began to say, oh, well, you're not Indian. You don't even have a clan now, see, because I'm white and I don't have a clan and you don't have a clan. That means that you don't have any relatives over there. That's a lie. That's a lie. Down through time, as our clan system continued to de deteriorate and its functionality was less um, potent, then you begin to see that people are, are trying to reach and figure out who they are. So when they began documenting things about Cherokees, when, uh, you know, scientists and anthropologists and you know all of the ologists of the world began to investigate uh, our culture and our and our belief systems and and so on and so on when they began to do that it was that time period that someone started asking the question they started asking the, this specific question i'm cherokee and my mom is white what clan am I? And when they began saying that, asking these questions, there were sometimes some people that had answers for them. The majority of the time, they just said, well, you're not Cherokee anymore. They don't consider you Cherokee anymore. The, a lot of people espoused to that particular idea. 
A lot of people believe that if you, if you have a mother who's black and a father who's Cherokee, that um, you no longer have a clan. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason that they, they didn't see them as being Cherokee was because they were not participating in anything. They didn't have a clan, they weren't participating. So as that clan system, people began to grow up thinking, oh, well, they say it's been written, it's documented that uh, Cherokees will go directly into the, the long hair clan. And that's the automatic clan that everybody that doesn't have a clan, that's where they go. If they're orphan, they go with the, with the long hair. The reason being is the word for long hair, aniki lohi. Aniki lohi is the way that you say long hair in, in uh, Cherokee. But if you say <clears throat> kilo, kilo daya, someone has just come. It's not, you don't know who it is, strangers. Kilo daya, aniki lo. It's connected. So they, they saw that, and they thought that that was the only clan in which Cherokees could be placed if they did not have a clan. That was what, that's, you'll read that in history books. You'll read that in stuff that Cherokee Nation even puts out. You'll read that stuff that, because that was what, was what was written at the time period. But truth be told, if this were a, a Cherokee tribal town, and we were attacked by the British, and they wiped out a half, of the, half of the population of the community, what they would do is they would literally and intentionally take members from other clans and s s plant them in, in these other seats and fill that clan system back up. So from, a begin from the very beginning stages of our world, the very beginning stages of uh, documented history or whatever you want to call it, our people had a system of, of dealing with the lack of. So you've got these seven clans and these seven families, and then you've got uh, people that are growing up without them, right? Growing up without participating in ceremonial life, without participating in, in their communities, and so on and so forth. And for all intents and purposes, they're just as much uh, a part of the colonial oppression as anybody else because they're out there being European, being something else, but not being Cherokee. You go down through there and back down through history again, and you'll see that the truth, the truth is, is that those families should have been taken into a clan regardless. They should have been taken into and, and, and given a family within a Cherokee community, and that would have strengthened our clan system right now, today. It would have, it would have made it much stronger than what it is. So they didn't do that. <clears throat> that didn't happen. They just basically um, pushed their own beliefs into Cherokee households and pushed their own beliefs into Cherokee communities. Now that doesn't mean that Cherokees didn't maintain their own identity, because we did. That didn't mean that, 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 that uh, the majority of the Cherokees that married into these families, married into European families, um, did not maintain their identity in their community and still have a place there. But as time went on and their descendants had their chance to participate, they did not. So their descendants were the ones who, who, who chose to go to a, you know, uh, a private school in Boston as opposed to being raised in a Cherokee community in the Southeast. You know, it was their, their descendants that chose to, um, to uh, you know, become plantation owners and so on and so forth and, and participate fully in the economy and the world of, of the southeastern part of the United States, which was predominantly, you know, um, slave owners. They participated in that. Um, all of these things that, 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 it, 
that continued, if the clan system would have been still in place within those families, they probably wouldn't have done those things. They wouldn't have participated in, in modern life for the time period. They would have um, uh, espoused to their own spiritual ideals and kept those things. Not saying that they didn't abandon that, that they abandoned them completely. At least uh, within themselves, they maintained it, but uh, they didn't pass that to their children. They didn't give that to their kids. So we've got the clan system, which is the, one of the best familial tie systems, familial makeups in the world. I, I, I promise you that this, this way of looking at things is, is so much stronger uh, than what it is today. Um, and it was important, and it would have been, it would have made our lives much better. So you have those people that, that, that believe that uh, if you don't have a clan, you either just go into long hair, and that's automatically where you're seated, or you don't have a clan altogether. That's what the, there's a lot of Cherokees, a lot of UKB, Katua people that believe that, it, that without that clan, you don't exist as a community member. They don't see you or at least acknowledge that you're a legitimate Cherokee, a legitimate to a person, you know, they don't acknowledge that. Um, they they see uh, that as being a, a loss. And and while people uh, believe those ideas, they don't talk about it. They don't go around telling everybody, oh well, you don't have a clan, so you're not really Cherokee or something along those lines. But that was the kind of a gold standard that existed for a little while. When people began to research about our people, when they began to study the information of all of those folks that came before and, and documented communities as they were and so on and so forth, all of that stuff, they began to filter through all of that and look and see what really happened and what, really, what the real deal was. Now, in Oklahoma, about the time of statehood, uh, there was about 26 to 30 Cherokee ceremonial grounds. That means 20, 20 to, 26 to 30 different communities that had a ceremonial fire, that participated in our ceremonial dances, that, um, that acknowledged that clan system, that, that utilized the clan system as far as ceremonies were concerned, all of those things that existed. But then you had these elders that live within those communities that will help ran these ceremonial places. And those folks were looking around and going, oh, well, uh, you know, we're, we're becoming more and more mixed with other people. We're becoming more and more um, not biologically Cherokee, whatever you want to call it, uh, mixed bloods, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, and and they and they and our clan system is going away. It's 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 not growing. It's grow, It's going away. Um, what do we do about that? And the truth is that let's see the 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 Trail of Tears happened in what 1838, 1839 that that time period. Um, the the ceremonial grounds actually were already here. The ceremonial fires were carried by specific community members a long time ago before statehood ever was even a thought. And they brought these fires and then they spread them in all the communities and all of these communities had them. But the clan system was still in the midst of its breakdown. It's still in the midst of its turmoil or whatever you want to call it. And these ceremonial grounds, the ones that still exist today, up until the 1980s. So in the 1980s, here in eastern Oklahoma, the majority of the Cherokee ceremonial grounds that existed here had a system in place to deal with this problem of lack of clan. So if you go to a Muscogee Creek ceremonial ground, almost always at a Muscogee Creek ceremonial ground or Seminole ceremonial ground, um, those folks will almost always seat a child that does not have a Muscogee Creek mother directly in the clan of the father's mother. They would, they would essentially adopt them 
into that particular clan, that family. And that's where they would sit, and that's where they would be expected to participate in ceremonies and so on and so forth and identify as, uh, you know, that clan and within that tribe. So Cherokee ceremonial grounds are actually um, have a decent amount of Muscogee influence. In fact, they influenced each other. And then the Shawnee grounds in influenced us, and the Seneca grounds influenced us, and we influenced and we shared things, and so on and so forth. And so uh, there are Cherokee ceremonial grounds that have uh, much more of a, a, a Muscogee or a Muscogee Creek influence at that ceremonial ground, and they follow that system generally. They follow that system, so they actually put people um, in the clans of their father's mother. Then there are Cherokee ceremonial grounds that actually place them um, in a specific clan, and some of those, and some of those ceremonial grounds are different. Uh, there's one ceremonial ground that automatically seats people in wolf, whether they have, whether they, um, you know, have a, a mother that's Cherokee or not. If they do not know their clan, if they do not know what that that the, what clan they are, then they're automatically seated in wolf. There are some that do the the long hair thing still yet. There are some that l allow two people to develop. Uh, such a close relationship that they begin to consider each other family and they use those two folks as a bridge to put someone in a clan and seat them there. They also um, do go about it ceremonially. Sometimes they'll use medicine, Cherokee ceremonial medicine, to check and see what, a clan, what clan a person is if they don't know what clan they are and seat them in that clan accordingly. So we have all of these different ways of dealing with the lack of clan, but we don't necessarily um, acknowledge that in every community. There, there are some communities they do and some communities they don't. But the truth be told, as I told you earlier, that our, our clans, um, our clan system as they were, were the most important thing. And, 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 uh, and we had, I don't remember how many I could, named off, at least four or five that have existed up until now in the 1980s. So we had ways of dealing with that lack of clan. And that, and that helped to, to strengthen our ceremonial grounds. It helps to be inclusive. It, it, it helps us to, to get away from the idea that, that, uh, that our ceremonial grounds are some sort of uh, country club and, and there's exclusivity and, and, and if you don't belong there, then you don't belong there, that kind of thing. None of that stuff is really true. If, if we're following our teachings and our traditions the way that we, we once did, um, we're supposed to be doing these dances and having these ceremonies and doing all of these things on behalf of the entire world. And if we're doing that, then we're including the entire world. And we should be including them uh, in, that, in, in our ceremonial life. Um, but the, the lack of clan uh, should not be a factor. And at most ceremonial grounds, it is not. They find a way around it. So we know this. We intermarried with other Cherokee, or with other uh, southeastern tribes and northeast woodlands tribes heavily for, since the beginning of time. During that time period, we had a, a system in place to deal with the lack of clans because our clans didn't match up. And then on top of that, uh, whenever we, we took the big hit of um, basically uh, female Europeans marrying into Cherokee families, that was the big hit, but we found a way to deal with that too. We found a way around it. And if you talk to some of our oldest speakers, some of our elders, some of them have passed away. I oftentimes reference elders, and sometimes uh, I, I don't uh, uh, explain that that person is already gone. Um, but there's one elder that I'm thinking of in particular right now, and his name was Benny Smith. Jake, huh? 
You say Jigae-san behind somebody's name whenever they've passed away because it, what it means is they used to be. So uh, Benny Smith Jigae-san uh, was a, a, an elder who grew up at one of, a, one of our most prominent ceremonial grounds here in eastern Oklahoma. And he was a traditionalist and a ceremonial and spiritual leader as well as a medicine person. And he, uh, he was raised that way. He was raised in that environment. And if you were to speak to him or be able to speak to him today, he would tell you that everybody in the world has a Cherokee clan. He would say that your Mexican friend who lives down the street fits into our clan system. He would say, your, your cousin who married a, a black woman or a black man, he would say, they have clans. He would say that our people, the human race, they all have clans and they all fit into the, this system. They just don't remember. They just don't know what their clan is, but they have one. So if that's the case, and we have all of these other ways of dealing with the lack of clan, and every, we know that everyone has a clan based upon what uh, Mr. Benny Smith said, then we know um, that it is not wrong to bring in people into your community and seat them where they're supposed to be and accept them as clan members from that particular clan. Our clan system, if it goes away completely, then we lose the fire. If we lose the fire, we, we lose the language. If we lose the language, we lose the fire. If we lose the clan, you know, it all fits on top of each other. It all connects, and it's very much, uh, you know, so ingrained in our identities that if we lose one thing, then, then the rest of the structure will fall. Just like in this building, if I was to chop this one beam down, the rest of this building is going to collapse down on top of us because it's all holding us together. The same way that this is all leaning on top of each other, it's all taken care of by itself. It's, it's self-governing. Okay? It's self-strengthening. Uh, it's, it's all of those things. And so... <clears throat> We have to maintain those things. We have to maintain our clan system. We have to um, ensure that, uh, that for future generations that um, Cherokee identity, whether it be clan, whether it be your language, whether it be a community, a family you belong to, all of those things have to be reinvigorated. Reinvigorated so much that that, uh, that uh, it's overflowing. Um, my job as, a, uh, as an educator for Cherokee Nation's Education Services um, simply means that I'm out in the communities pushing our language, culture, and traditions like a drug dealer. I'm trying to get people hooked on their own identity, especially young people. If young people are, 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 are like little sponges, as they say, then everything that I say to them whenever I go out into their communities and I, uh, I, I tell them about these things, I tell them about our language, I, I uh, demonstrate our ceremonial games and, and ball games and, and so on and so forth, all of these things, then that may be just that right moment that they get hooked on the idea of their own identity being rooted in a world that looks like this. And that's really important. Um, I think it would be good to, to talk about the clan names and a little bit about uh, some of the, the traits that are expected or the, or the behaviors that are oftentimes associated with specific clans. Um, if we start with the very first clan that I'm looking at, uh, Paint clan. People oftentimes refer to paint clan as ani wode. Wode by itself. That word by itself, wode, it just means paint. People will sometimes call it red paint clan. But the reason that they call it that is because uh, of the linguistic 
relationship to red paint specifically. Red paint is uh, medicine. Red paint that we utilized to paint our bodies in the times of war and in times of ball games. We would, we would sometimes paint ourselves entirely red. And that color red uh, represents a lot of different things. Wool dee by itself is just paint, but wool tea. Nuwol tea. If you say that word, nuwol tea, that means medicine. So those two words are connected to each other. The color red is associated with blood, with life, with um, power and strength, all of those things. It was used to intimidate their, our, our um, adversaries. It was a way to, to make yourself uh, look strong and powerful. But that paint that they put on, that they're talking about, in reference to the clan and in general, is uh, generally uh, in English referred to as uh, iron oxide or red ochre. And that red ochre, when you paint yourself with it, you don't even have to mix it with oil or animal fat or anything. You can take that, just that mineral by itself and rub it on yourself and it will paint you. Much in the same way uh, that a woman puts on makeup. It's, it's, it's very, very similar. And you become a, a color of red that actually is somewhere in between the color of dirt and somewhere in between the color of blood mixed together. The word for mud in Cherokee, tlawote, tlawote. It's also related. So the word mud is related to that. So you've got medicine, paint, mud, and one more. And this other one is the word uwoduhi. Uwoduhi. Uwodu. Beautiful. It's the word for beautiful. That, the root of that word is also related. So if you paint yourself red, if you're using that medicine that they're referring to as, as far as that clan is concerned, you're making yourself beautiful. You're making yourself vibrant, alive. All of those kinds of things. So when people refer to red paint clan, and red paint medicine, or that they're the, the keepers of that medicine, they're saying that that particular tribe or that particular clan, that particular family is, uh, is the ones who used it more. It's not saying that any other, other clan didn't use that paint, but it's saying that that particular clan is the ones that used it more. Next in here, inside of the council house, we have uh, anikah, anikah, Some people will say ani ahwe because the word for deer is ahwe. But it's really, whenever they say it in Cherokee, usually speakers will oftentimes say ani kahwe, ani kah, ani kah. Those folks are deer clan. Deer clan folks are generally associated with. Uh, warriors and hunters. They would have been uh, the people that were that uh, were that was their profession. Their profession was being a warrior. Their profession was hunting. Those folks oftentimes would have come from that particular clan. Um, some people say that that they're also uh, messengers. Uh, and so there's a little bit of argument about whether that's the truth or not, but um, the idea is that they were runners. They were fast. And if they needed to get a message somewhere, they probably could. So Deer Clan is, ne is the next on the list. Um, generally, the, the folks that are Deer Clan are, are oftentimes pretty assertive people. 
They, they're outspoken oftentimes. Uh, you know, Cherokees have a, a unique social norm and where we're very careful about the way that we speak with each other. But sometimes people from Deer Clan uh, have a tendency to um, be a little more outspoken than the rest of us. And, and I think that comes from uh, the strength of that particular family and the, the belief that they were providers and things of that nature. So they were very, very, uh, not aggressive, but definitely um, outspoken. And, and, and to some degree in Cherokee communities, that's a little bit out of the norm, to be honest with you. But next on the list, right over here, is Wolf Clan. On the Wahia, people will say on the Wahai. People will say on the Wahia. Wahia. Wahia means wolf. On the means they are, or, it, or it's talking about people, personifies it. On the Wahia. On the Wahia, or on the Wahai Wolf Clan, folks. Um, <clears throat> People generally and most often associate them and, and believe them to be the warriors of the community. They were um, probably the first to go into battle. They were the ones that were out front leading a, a, a war party. They were the ones who, who probably sought to... Um, to go to war inside of this council house a long time ago, if a, a member of Wolf Clan um, decided that the Muscogee Creek or the Shawnee or the British or whomever had done something that they that they shouldn't have done and that we needed to seek retribution, they would come inside of this council house with a, the entirety of the community and they would seek out individuals that were willing to join their cause. In other words, they were creating uh, enlistment parties, just like for the military. When someone joins the military, they enlist. In order to enlist in our communities a long time ago, you first uh, agreed with the things that were being put forth before you, the things that were being talked about, and then on top of that, they would in, end up stepping out here with whatever leader that was trying to, to rouse their spirits and bring them into the fold as far as going to war. So, they would invite those folks to come and dance. And if they danced, it was their way of, of, uh, of uh, basically signing up, joining the military, so to speak. Um, they say that Wolf Clan folks are um, the most aggressive of all of the um, ceremonial grounds and the communities and the, and the areas around here that generally people that belong to that particular clan uh, are, are not only outspoken but even abrasive. They, are, uh, they can be um, sh on, a, on a regular basis showing their teeth, if that makes sense. They can be on a regular basis purposely um, showing that they are, are, are responsible. And because of that, if a wolf clan aunt or a wolf clan uncle uh, exists at a ceremonial ground, uh, especially over those, those, those fa that family, but also over the entirety of the ground, they oftentimes take a parent role with everybody and have a tendency to be bossy and pushy and, and, uh, and, and just all out assertive. And, and, and that's... Uh, to some degree when in Cherokee communities, especially around elders and, and fluent speakers, if you're hanging out with them, uh, you're very careful on how you speak to them and how you deal with them. You do not step on their toes. You do not uh, say things that would otherwise offend them or, or make them angry with you. You're careful, super careful. But at the ceremonial grounds, those folks realize that you sit in a certain area and they allow you to um, to express the full range of your clan personality I suppose so next on our list next to wolf clan is Anigilohe Anigilohe 
That word is associated with, people will sometimes say it's called twister clan in English. Sometimes they'll say it's called long hair clan. Uh, and they also say that it's called stranger clan. And the reason that they say those things is because linguistically, the word kilo means someone that you don't know. If I'm, out, if I'm sitting at my house and I hear a car pull up, I can tell my son, kilo daya. Somebody is here. I don't know who, but somebody is here. If they're on the kilo, on the kilo, on the kilo then, then it's possible that that is the clan that was comprised of um, people who you didn't know. They were, that, that's where people get the idea that that's the clan that you're supposed to be planting people without clans in. That's the, that's the clan that will take you in. That's the clan that takes in orphaned children and so on and so forth. And because of those beliefs and that connection linguistically, that's what they'll say. Um, but people argue about the one way or the other. Uh, but regardless, uh, it's the majority of Cherokee people regard it and, and uh, refer to it specifically as long hair, long hair clan. Next on our list is Bird Clan. Onigi Squaw. Onigi Squaw. People will shorten it sometimes and say Onigi Onigi But it's Onigi Squaw is Bird Clan. And Bird Clan is almost often, almost always associated with, um, for certain, even more so than the, the, the Deer Clan. Uh, messengers, they were the pure procu procurers of um, eagle feathers. Um, a long time ago, eagle feathers were considered so sacred that people did not con just carry them around. They didn't just have them in their houses. They didn't just keep them, you know, in a, in a cedar box in their house like they do nowadays. And eagle feathers were kept by specific people, and those people during ceremonies would hand those out and allow those people to use those eagle feathers. And then once the dance was over with, they would then get those eagle feathers back from them and take care of them. So they were the ones that were responsible. They were the only ones, the only, they're the only tribe that's allowed to kill an eagle. They don't do it anymore, but a long time ago they did. They, would, uh, they wouldn't refer to it as an eagle, but, they, but they, they, would, uh, they would take eagles for specifically for the use of their feathers. So they, they had a major ceremonial role ingrained in just their identity as being uh, from that clan, from the bird clan. Uh, next on our list is uh, Ani Sahon. Ani Sahone is the long way. Ani Sahone. Um, people refer to it as Blue Clan. Uh, some people will refer to it, they actually do refer to it as Bear Clan, even though uh, it's not referencing a bear necessarily. Uh, the reason that they do that is because um, the word Sahone. You can use that to talk about a, a bear's shoulders when it's walking and it's lumbering around and its shoulders are shifting back and forth. You can use that word, use that a part of that word to 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 talk about that. Um, so people will sometimes refer to it as bear, uh, bear clan or a clan that is associated with bears. Um, some people will call it panther clan. And say that Ani Sahon is talking about is is in reference to uh, panthers that existed in the mountains of uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and all of those good places over there in, in the east, the southeast. Um, but people also will, will refer to it as blue holly. Uh, but the word for blue in Cherokee, the color blue, Sakonige. Sakonige means blue. Ani Sahoni. You see where it's close, right? So that's, it's, it's uh, likely that it's in reference to that color specifically. 
These folks are what some people refer to as the burden bearers of the community. They, they, they carry the weight of their people. They're the ones who, uh, who find the way to lift us up in times when we are on the ground. They're the ones that, 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 uh, that take care of, uh, you know, children specifically. People say it's long hair. People say it's blue clan. I say it's both. I say that it's both. Um, but the, that particular clan is, is, uh, is associated with uh, certain types of medicine as well, quite heavily, to be, to be honest with you. And then we have last but not least, and that's um, wild potato. I guess I'm saying that like a country Cherokee guy, you know, wild potato. Uh, wild potato. Uh, the wild potato clan um, is uh, oftentimes referred to as Aniko de Gewe. Aniko de Gewe. The, the, the wild potato is, is an actual plant. You can find wild potatoes growing that have vines on them. But in the old stories that, that they, they talk about our clan system and, and what these sort of things represent, um, they, they, they talk about how that clan came to be. So um, it's heavily associated with uh, herbal medicine, plant life, of course, and oftentimes uh, a lot of people believe that the, that the uh, uh, chiefs would come from that particular clan. Um, truth is that we had chiefs that came from all of them, but some people say that that particular clan uh, is, was most often the clan that, that usually produced a, a chief of a community. Um, our old system was a two-part system, not a two-party system. Hey. Uh, it was a two-part system, and what, what I mean by that is that there was a, uh, a system in place for times of peace with uh, chiefs and all their assistants and all of, the, all of the medicine workers and ceremonial practitioners and so on and so forth. And then in times of war, uh, we had another government that would completely change places. These guys that were all the chiefs that were sitting in, sitting in these positions would step away and then these red chiefs would step in. And the red chiefs would come oftentimes from wolf or deer or, or something along those lines. Usually the more, more aggressive uh, warrior-like uh, associated, associated clans, I guess. Um, but that's, that's all of them. Um, there are some old stories that say that we actually had 14 clans at one time and that we lost seven. Um, there are people that disagree with that, but the old stories are there. Um, it's possible because if you go to the northeastern part of the United States and you hang out with the, some of the folks in the Iroquois Confederacy, a.k.a. The, actually their real name is uh, Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, Mohawks, Hurons, Onondagas, uh, Seneca, Cayugas, and, and uh, those tribes up there, um, we are heavily connected to them. In some ways, we're more culturally like them than we are our Muscogee Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaws, and, and other, uh, all the other Muscogean-speaking people that are around us in the southeast. So we, uh, it's, it's very possible that at one time the Iroquois people were the Haudenosaunee people uh, who also speak the same language family as us. They're, they're an um, Iroquoian-based language, um, and, our, and, and as our Cherokees, we, we're much more connected to them in a lot of ways. So it's possible that we did leave some clans somewhere. It's possible that we did lose families. Um, but So let's say this is my clan, Wolf Clan, over here. And I'm, a, a, again, a 17-year-old Cherokee man. The reason that we married so early um, during that time period is because the average life expectancy of a Cherokee man was about 30 years old. 
So during this time period, uh, if you made it past 30 and into your 40s and 50s, you were considered an elder right then and there. Um, today, that standard has gone up. You know, we, we see our elders as being 60 and 70 years old. But truth be told, if you made it past 30, you, you actually made it past your life expectancy anyway. So they married very early. They married so early that, that it almost seems, you know, a little bit crazy. But the, I, let's say I'm this clan and uh, my prospective wife or girlfriend is this clan. And I want to get married to her. And we go and we t talk to our families and we say we're going to do this, we're going to get married, and our families don't really tell us what to do one way or the other. They just support us. But I offer her family uh, some deer meat. And if the, her family accepts that deer meat, then, um, then they have accepted me. And then essentially, you know, like I said, we only just move in together. That's, that's a Cherokee marriage a long time ago. We moved in together. Divorce was very common. If people didn't like each other, they just simply split up. It was just that simple. But I move in with the entirety of my in-laws all in this, in this one area of the community. Let's pretend that this is uh, a bunch of houses as, as opposed to just the, uh, the clan beds. But I, I move into this particular area of the community, and I, and I, I have clothes there. I have uh, hunting stuff there, but I'm never there. I'm never there. I am either hunting, going to war, doing ceremonies, and raising my sister's kids, my cousin's kids, my female relative's kids. They're the ones that I'm raising. I'm raising them. Let's say I have four sisters and each one of them has four kids. Those, those kids all belong to me. And it's my responsibility to rear them and teach them everything they need to know about being wolf clan. I'm supposed to teach them how to hunt and so on and so forth. I have children over here that are biologically mine that I, that I love and care for and I help provide for them sort of financially speaking by contributing to the household with what I've hunted and so on and so forth. But it's not my job to raise these kids. I love these kids. I'm affectionate with them when I see them, but I'm most of the time am raising these children over here. Those kids are not suffering from the lack of a father figure in any way, shape, or form. How many brothers do you think she has? How many cousins and, and uncles and grandpas and so on and so forth all exist in this one little area right here? A lot of them. There's a ton of them. There's so many, in fact, that those kids couldn't get away with nothing if they wanted to. There's so many adults over here that are assisting her and raising her child that they don't have to worry about it. Over here, the, the two kids that belong to me and this girl, these folks are, are relative, and you care about these people, and you know who they are, but these people are the ones that you grow up with and spend every day of your life with, and you know everything about them, and they are your blood relatives. The, the, the kids that, that, that come from this union, my marriage to a girl in the bird clan, those kids have their own uncles and aunts that are talina edgy. Talina Edo, second mom and second dad. But my brothers and sisters over here are not Talina Eji, Talina Edo. Those are Eduji, Etlogi, aunt and an uncle. But over here, it's second mom and second dad. So these kids, let's say for, for argument's sake, that she's my sister right? She's my sister, and her son uh, at age 13 accidentally killed someone. Whether he did it on purpose or, 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 or on accident, it doesn't really matter. His negligence, whatever, caused someone's death. The family of that particular uh, person that died is going to expect him to forfeit his life, to make things even again. The entirety of the community would probably honor that. And when that family came and said, hey, you know, you killed one of our relatives, 
uh, you know, you, you, you forfeited your life. The, even a young man would honor that. Even a young man would, honor, would say, you're right, I did, and, 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 and I'm, I'm allowing you to go ahead and take my life. And they would do it. But let's say this, this, uh, this nephew of mine um, is 13 years old. He's never played a Cherokee ball game together. He, he's, he's, he's never gone to war. He's never been married. He doesn't have any kids. He's not, it's, it's like his, his, his existence would cease. I'm an older man. I've got kids. I've got grandkids coming. I've got, you know, all kinds of relatives. I've been to war a bunch of times and, and seen life and done things. And, and, and his mistake doesn't belong to him. It actually belongs to me. It belongs to me because I'm the one who raised him. His uncle, I, his uncle, am responsible for his identity, for his uh, well-behaving in the community and doing right and thinking right and following all of the things that he's supposed to do and all of that kind of stuff. So the failure really isn't his, it's mine. So on behalf of my nephew, I would step in front of him and stand in front of those families that expected payment of death because of their, their loved one that died, and I would say, you need a life for the life that you, that you lost, and we agree on that. But today, he's just a young man, a stupid kid that made some mistakes, and I'm the real one that's responsible for him, so if you'll, you'll accept it, I'll offer my life instead of his. And they would accept it. I don't do that for my... For my bird clan kids over here that belong to my wife, I don't do that for them. I do that for my aunt, for, for my sister's kids, my cousin's kids, my female relative's kids. I do not do that for this, this family over here because they have their own uncles. They have their own mothers and, and fathers that are taking care of each one of these kids in that, in that particular clan. It's not my responsibility to take care. If something like that were to happen with my son, my son killed someone or, or someone lost their life because of him, it would be one of their family that would step in and do the same exact thing that I was just talking about for my nephew. That's how important those uncles were, and that really shows you actually where the father um, fatherly responsibilities lied. They lied with those uncles. The, the motherly responsibilities lied with those aunts. So your aunts and your cousins and your female relatives were not just your relatives, but also they were um, a part of uh, a familial system that ensured that regardless of what happened, you know, life expectancy for a Cherokee man is 30. If I die before I'm 30, do you think my, my kids are not going to be taken care of? It doesn't matter if I die before I'm 30. It doesn't matter if I die after that because I know that my brothers, my cousins, my male relatives are going to be raising my children. The same goes for women. It's the same thing. This system, if it was still what it once was, there would be so much more, our community be, communities would be so much more strong than they are right now. I'm not saying they aren't because we've, we've, uh, we have um, made it through a, an awful lot of tough times. You know, the Trail of Tears, the Civil War, you know, uh, the Civil War was just, just as bad or worse than the, chair, than the Trail of Tears. So um, we've been through all of these majorly trying times. And, and we've survived. People oftentimes will say, see, oh, they don't, huh? See, oh, they don't, huh? That means that we're still here. If we're still here, then they, you know, the, the, despite it all, uh, then, then we're faring pretty well. I'm not saying that, I, that uh, things can't go back to the way they were because um, we're working towards that. Uh, we're working towards everybody having a clan, having representation in their family, having a ceremonial place. We're working towards giving our culture and our traditions and our language back to our people uh, who, by, 
you know, by today's standards, the most, for the most part, do not participate. So, yeah, we're walking uphill in the snow both ways, but we're still working. We're still fighting, and we're still keeping our culture and our traditions and our languages alive. Siona Garwu, Gaile, Le Chirse, JP, Dawadon, Dodadago Handina, Dejadox, they say to you. I really appreciate you guys putting up with me. Uh, we're uh, here at uh, the Cherokee Heritage Center in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, on behalf of the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville, Arkansas. <laughs>